So good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, as we wait for more participants to join, perhaps we can just start with a quick round of introduction. You can tell us uh, your name, um, where you work or what you do, and which country you're logging in from. So we'll start with Yan Lian Hei. Yeah, Yuin Lian Hei. My name is uh, Yuin Lian. Okay, where are you from and what do you do? I'm from China for 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 supply for for export much of a job. Oh, fantastic. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes. My name is Ian. Hi Ian. My name is Ian Ashabaewa. I'm uh -huh. based in Kampala, Uganda, and I'm a supply chain specialist. Oh, fantastic. Which organization? The organization is called Rights One Solutions, Uganda Limited. Oh, fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm here. I'm from the Netherlands. Can you hear me? Yes, Andre, we can hear you from Netherlands. Okay. I'm from a Dutch-based uh, company who is uh, uh, who is specialized in making projects predictable. Oh, fantastic! Welcome. Thank you for organizing it. Agatha, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about uh, what you do and where you're calling from. I. Agatha from Uganda. I work with a, a company called APMS Solutions. It is in two market entry, business intelligence, market research, and organizing trade meetings. Thank you for joining and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chris Sawanda, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Karibu sana. Go ahead and introduce Thank yourself. You. Thank you. My name is Chris Oanda from uh, Kenya, Nairobi. I am a supply chain consultant. I work with the Global Procurement Academy. Welcome, Chris. Okay, go ahead, Frank. Now that you're online, you can introduce yourself. So I work in advertising and uh, I've worked with several Chinese companies in uh, Kenya. Okay. So I'm just keen to understand, uh, keen to tap into your knowledge. Okay. Karibu sana, welcome. Thank you. Godfrey. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Kingsley. I, I work with um, USAID Global Health Supply Chain Project uh, and currently in Nigeria. I also hope to learn a lot from this. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Welcome. Welcome all the way from Nigeria. Good to have you here. Patricia, can you hear us? Hi, how are you? Very well. Thank you for I logging can, in. I can, hear, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh -huh. So we just were doing a quick round of introduction. Tell us who you are and what you do. And where you're coming from? Patricia Kadorima. Kenya, based in Mombasa. I'm a procurement and supply chain management professional. Yeah. I provide outsourced services specifically in corporate training, and I do part time lecturing in the same field. Okay, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Uh, ben and Harry, I see we have 45 participants. Are we ready to start or would you like to still hear from the participants? I'm ready whenever you are. I think we okay. can start, uh, we can start roll. So uh, the guys will, will keep on joining and uh, will find us on the way. So. Uh, I expect many questions out of this topic, so 
I, I will hand it over to you, Rose, to introduce the topic, and then Dan will pick it up, introduce himself and his organization, and he will take uh, the discussion forward. All right. Thank you, Ben. Um, a very good evening to everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening um, for our webinar. And today's topic is about successful China sourcing and contracting. Now, there have been very many stories about doing business in China, some exceptionally successful, others quite horrifying. These include foreign companies entering into contracts with Chinese companies that do not exist or the joint venture partner who was quote unquote a friend that appropriates all the assets and knowingly the joint venture was set up in a way to leave the foreign company with no legal recourse. So this evening we'll be joined by Dan Harris who will be speaking to us around, you know, what are some of the tips around successful sourcing and contracting, especially with um, Chinese businesses. What are some of the common mistakes, risks, pitfalls, and how do you get the right partners or strategic linkages with those organizations? Um, we'll also touch a little bit about strategic sourcing and supply chain management, as well as dispute resolution mechanisms um, in light of this. So Dan, welcome. Welcome to Africa, welcome to Kenya. I'm sure it's very early on your end, quite late on this side but it's glad to have you here. So before Dan introduces himself on the topic, allow me to invite Ben, um, who's the founder of House of Procurement, to give some opening remarks before Dan can take over. So Karibu Sana, Ben. Thank you very much, Rose. Uh, uh, this is our maybe fifth or fourth, fifth or sixth uh, webinar. Uh, our focus is still based on uh, what is happening now and the knowledge that practitioners, business owner, executives, and anybody in the industry is able to apply, find relevant and uh, impactful in their places of work and businesses. And contracting in China, especially the China state-owned enterprises and other businesses is key. Um, while other countries might be moving and repatriating capacities back to their countries, Europe and the US and the likes, Africa somehow is strategically stuck with China, be it the debt that we have, or really that we don't have an alternative. Um, and in any case, the West is quite expensive for us. So now knowing that we are stuck here, and there's a breakdown of trust, especially in the supply chain due to coronavirus, how do we go forward? How do we ensure we have enforceable contracts? What do we look for in the contracts? What do we look for when we negotiate? A lot of things that we have not been able to do at ESG, CSR, localization, how do we achieve those things? Uh, why do we arbitrate? And Dan is going to take us through this. Um, I can see someone is saying I speak up. So Dan is going to take us through this and give us tips, ideas uh, on what uh, we need to do, what we need to look out for. Dan is an international uh, mind, recognized mind on this. He'll introduce himself on that. And after this, you can ask him as many questions as possible. After the webinar, we'll share the recording as well as uh, Dan uh, Harris' uh, contacts where if you want to engage further in a business or consulting or support, you can reach to him or even to me directly. Thank you very much and welcome, Dan. Okay, good. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone. I am delighted to be here um, in Africa, I guess. Um, so uh, a little bit about me, I and my law firm, we do a lot of international work, a lot of international manufacturing. Uh, we started with China probably tw about 20 years ago. And for many, many years, China was roughly 99 to 100% of our manufacturing and supply chain work. Uh, fortunately, that number has actually declined. And I say fortunately because just like probably so many of you out there want to be diversified, we want to be diversified. And we've been forced to diversify because of 
the tariffs that the United States has put on China and all the problems between the United States and China and even between Europe and China um, and various other countries in China. Uh, our clients are probably 70% US, 30% other with um, probably 70 to 80% of the other being from Europe Austra and Australia um, and with a little bit from Africa, a little bit from Latin America. Um, we have lawyers in China, we have lawyers in the United States and we have lawyers in Europe. We do a lot with Spain. Um, we're starting to do more with Africa to our delight uh, because we see Africa as rising in importance. We've done um, some manufacturing and supply chain work with Ethiopia. And believe it or not, we've even done a little bit of um, movie and entertainment work, which we do in China. We've done some of that with uh, Nigeria. Um, but the reality is the world is changing. I think we could say that at <laughs> any time. Um, but a lot is changing with China these days um, with the coronavirus and with the issues China is having with other countries. Now, uh, it's funny because I was not planning to talk about the coronavirus at all because in my mind, it hasn't been, uh, from a legal perspective, it hasn't been very impactful. All it has done is sort of highlight and reinforce what I ordinarily talk about when you're sourcing from China. Um, and it has done that because it has increased the risks. And literally every single day, I get anywhere from one to five emails from somebody who has bought personal protective equipment from China and not had it delivered or had incredibly bad product delivered. And they're asking me, can you help us? And my answer usually is, well, I can charge you money to look at what you've done, but the odds are overwhelming that I cannot help you. And then they say, why? And I say, because if you're coming to me now and with this problem, you probably did a lot wrong. And today I will talk about some of the things people do wrong that get them in that situation. Uh, and P coronavirus has just uh, tripled or quadrupled um, <clears throat> these sorts of problems. And, and they've done it because people are rushing and they've done, and it's done it because there are a lot of Chinese companies right now that are not doing very well at all. And they're not doing well because they went through two or three months of being closed down because of the coronavirus in China. And now they've gone through two, two or three more months of problems because the world is partially shut down and not ordering from China. And desperate companies make for desperate moves and desperate moves lead to the horrifying, and I'm, I'm using uh, the word that Rose used, and I think that's a good word, it, it leads to horrifying situations. So I, I am now going to, um, start the heart of my webinar. And I'm gonna start it with something that I always say at the beginning of every speech I give relating to China, protecting your intellectual property from China. And what I start out saying is that big companies in China want to steal your IP. Small companies in China wanna steal your intellectual property. Government-owned companies in China want to steal your IP. Privately held companies in China want to steal your IP. And that company whose owner has invited you 
to his or her son's or daughter's wedding, that company also wants to steal your IP. In other words, every company in China wants to steal your IP. Now, I always modify that by saying every country in the world wants to steal IP. So why do I talk about it in the context of China? Well, the reason I talk about it in the context of China is because it's more common and easier to do when you're a Chinese company. And that's because the Chinese legal system, in fact, the entire Chinese system is set up to favor Chinese companies over foreign companies. So the playing field is not level. And what I just said about intellectual property holds true with everything that you do with China. You have to be careful. It's not like um, buying, let's say, from the United Kingdom. It's just a very different situation. And uh, I don't know what, uh, how China is viewed in your countries. I don't know how um, companies in all the countries from which that are represented here today deal with China, but I can tell you that American companies and European companies, particularly Northern European companies and Australian companies tend to be very naive in dealing with China. And actually I can add Latin American countries to that. So there, there is a lot of naivete when dealing with China, almost this belief that, hey, I hear about China, but this person I'm dealing with there, they seem so different. They invite me to their sons and daughters' weddings. Well, it does not matter. Eventually, money is money, and the legal system is the legal system, and you need to set yourself up from the beginning to deal with that. And that's, those are the things I'm going to be talking about here today. And, and by the way, if anyone has any questions at any time, feel free to just jump right in. I love questions. It tells me uh, what people are thinking. So do not hesitate. Ask them anytime. Ask them during. Ask them at the end. Okay, so I always say there are three keys uh, to successful sourcing from China. Number one, structural protections. Number two, good contracts. Number three, good registrations. Now, there's a fourth thing out there, which I tend not to talk about because it's, it's what happens after uh, my job is over and that's quality control monitoring. And uh, I am not an expert in that, and I'm sure many of you are. So I, I'm gonna focus on sort of the beginnings of the relationship and the legal protections that uh, you can have. So again, structural protect protections, good contracts, good registrations. I'm gonna go through each of those things. Okay, structural protections. Who are you dealing with in China? This is the most important thing of all. I tell our clients, we can charge you thousands of dollars and draft the perfect contract for you. But if your supplier in China is a crook, that contract is not worth anything at all. Uh, and I think most of you are going to understand what I mean by that. I mean, if, if the Chinese company is a crook, if the Chinese company doesn't even exist, what good is a contract? I mean, you, you can't really hunt them down. The system just doesn't work that way. So know who you are dealing with. I swear 90% of the time when people have major problems with their Chinese supplier, it's because they did not do their research. In fact, oftentimes they did literally no research at all. And we're seeing that every day right now with PPE, personal protective equipment to protect against the coronavirus. So do your due diligence. Well, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> I mean, it can mean a lot of things. Number one, 
the first thing you should do because it's free, because it's easy, because you can do it is go on Google and Google the company. Every um, end of the year, Christmas time in the United States, we get a huge number of emails and phone calls from people who bought product in China and had problems. And usually these are small purchases. Um, oftentimes though, there'll be a, a, a relatively small purchase. Somebody will buy $50,000 worth of iPads to try to sell you know, during the Christmas season. And the person will say, you know, this is the name of the company. And while they're talking to me, I will do a Google search and the first page will show the name of the company and there'll be everything on that company says fraud, scam, cheat, crook. They didn't even do a Google search. At least do that. That can knock off, knock out a lot of companies. Um, but if you're going to be, if you're deal, if you're going to be serious, if you're going to be making larger purchases, you should do more than that. The, the next minimum thing you should do is confirm that the company really exists. And that is relatively easy. Uh, there are government websites in China, in Chinese, but find somebody, uh, it doesn't have to be a lawyer, it just has to be someone who, uh, a college educated Chinese person could figure it out get on there, look up the company, make sure it exists. Because a lot of times when someone sends over $50,000, even a million dollars, even $3 million, and we have seen that, uh, they send the money over and get no product. Then they come and hire us. And the first thing we do is see who we need to try to collect from and there is no company there. It literally does not exist. And it's quite possible that that fake company is not even, that the people behind that fake company are not even in China. They could be anywhere in the world. I could right now claim I have a Chinese company and sell you a million dollars worth of product. And that happens. So it takes, somebody who, who knows what they're doing, it takes them five minutes. Uh, I'm sure in most of your countries, uh, probably all of them, you can go online and see if a company exists. You can do the same thing with China. And real Chinese companies are a lot less likely to lie, cheat, and steal because they have something worth protecting. They have a company, they have a name, they have a reputation. It's not that easy, it's not that cheap to form a Chinese company. Once you form a Chinese company, you have to pay taxes. They don't want their Chinese company to be ruined by cheating somebody out of $50,000. So make sure it exists. The other thing you should do while you're at it is make sure it exists and is licensed to sell you what it's selling you. So for instance, if you're buying airplane parts and you find out that the company is in the sock business, it doesn't mean that they're crooks. It does mean that you could your chances of problems are greater. And one of the reasons is because you are not dealing with the airplane parts manufacturer you're dealing with a middle person. And there are all sorts of problems that are inherent in dealing with a middle person. Number one, you, you're going to almost certainly be paying more. Number two, you're not dealing directly with the manufacturer and that itself has legal ramifications. So the, the classic example that I like to give is when we were first starting to deal with China, a company out of Florida called us because they were told they were not going to get their Christmas tree lights until December. And they had bought about $3 million worth of Christmas tree lights. 
and they asked us to call their factory to ask what was going on and what could they do to get their Christmas tree lights in time for Christmas. So we called the factory and we said, we're representing such and such Florida company and um, they want to know what's going on with their Christmas tree lights. And the Chinese factory said, we've never heard of this company. It turned out that our client was buying through a broker. That broker owed the Chinese factory more than a million dollars. And the Chinese factory was saying, we're not gonna give anybody anything until this broker pays us the million dollars. Um, our client ended up having to pay about $800,000 extra to get its lights. So that, that's just one problem. One time we had a case where we were representing a Chinese company and um, in a dispute with an American company and the American company had paid the money to the same company that it always paid it to, but it was not to the Chinese manufacturer. And we told the American company, look, if you sue us for this so-called bad, bad product, we're going to sue you because you never paid us for it. And they didn't. They had paid somebody else. So there are a lot of problems that can happen there. Um, so make sure the company exists. Make sure that it's licensed to sell you what it's selling you. Lastly, go there. I love telling this to clients because what I then say is, look, I'm telling you about the importance of this, and this makes us no money. But in our, in our experience, companies that actually go visit their Chinese supplier, they are the ones that have good long-term relationships far more often. All of a sudden, you become a human being. You become someone who actually cares. You start understanding what your supplier's issues are. Um, I cannot stress the importance of that. I, I, I've begged clients to go, they go, and then they come back and they tell me, you know, that was the best thing I ever did. Uh, together we developed this new product or together we figured out how to make our existing product better. It really is important. And it's it, compared to lawyer's fees, at least American lawyer's fees, it's cheap. Okay, another reason to go there. Uh, I stole this idea from a client of mine who has been in uh, the auto parts sourcing business from China for about 20 years. Um, and he had real life pictures. I stole all my pictures, not stole, I took all my pictures off the website, off the internet. This is what every Chinese company's website looks like. It looks perfect, clean, people wearing, uh, you know, hazmat suits, etc. Beautiful factory. Then you go there, and this might be the reality. That's another advantage of going there. Um, this does happen. Used to happen a lot more 15 years ago. Less now, it still happens. Okay, so you're conducting your due diligence. One of the things you should do is ask the Chinese company for its documents. Don't be afraid. Um, Americans tend to be afraid to do this. They say, oh, this means I don't trust them. Well, guess what? Chinese companies do this to each other. This is how business is done in China. Ask for the documents. But then when you get the documents, be careful. There are a lot of fake documents out there. We've had a lot of cases where people have sent us documents um, and we immediately know they're fake. Um, there might be a company that's supposedly in Shenzhen and all their documents say they're in Shanghai, fake. Um, the other day um, we were, this is on a, a PPE matter. We, we, our clients sent us the Chinese company documents and I opened them up and in about 30 seconds, I, st I literally started laughing 
because they had a document showing that they were uh, certified by the United States FDA. And it was the fakest looking document I had ever seen in my life. I mean, it was just such an obvious fake. It was not a US document. There were misspellings. The signature line listed the government officials hotmail address. It was a terrible document that immediately told us we were dealing with scammers because the real Chinese company, it was people pretending to be with a real Chinese company. The real Chinese company was approved by the US FDA. So why would the real company send a fake FDA certificate? So look at the documents, but don't trust them. Uh, Look, I always say, look around, ask around. If you go visit the factory, one of the best things you can do is, is look, in the, look at the factory, look at what's going on there, and then come back the next day on a surprise visit and look again, see if it's the same. And ask people in the neighborhood, uh, hire someone Chinese and talk to people in the neighborhood and say, hey, what do you know about this company? You can learn an incredible amount of information that way. We've done that. We've learned, oh, they're a great employer. That's good. We've learned, oh, they cheat everyone. They're about to go out of business. They're not even paying their employees. They haven't paid them for months. That's good information. Uh, scrutinize the paper. Let's just look at it carefully. Then I always say, delegate this and do not delegate this. And, and uh, what, this is me, I guess, trying to be Zen. But what I really mean by this is there are certain things you know that no one else knows. So if you're uh, selling widgets, you know widgets. You should be the one to go to the widget factory. Uh, I, I have a client who um, has been in the fish business for 30 years, and he tells me he can walk into a fish processing facility and within five minutes know whether they're good or bad. He knows fish processing. You know widgets. You should do that. Don't ask your lawyer to do that. Don't ask somebody, you know, who you just happen to know in China who uh, was an English major in college to do that. You do that. But then when it comes to other things, don't do it. Delegate it. Don't draft your contracts. Delegate that to a lawyer who knows how to draft contracts with Chinese companies. Okay. I put this slide in every talk I give on China. Uh, because to me, this is the key. Um, and it's especially important for companies that are used to dealing with really strong legal systems. Because what happens is, typical with an American company, a European company, they either think China is just like the United States, or they think that China is the wild, wild west. That's what people call it in the United States. And they have absolutely no laws whatsoever. So there's no point in having any contract. They're only gonna cheat me. Uh, it's all temporary. Both of those views are wrong. The, the right view as is true uh, of so many things is really the middle ground. And uh, that is that you've got to think about what is important to your Chinese counterparty and what is important to you and try to make something work. This is not try to make something work legally because if you come to us, to a lawyer with a deal, they can almost always draft it up. That's not the hard part. The hard part is getting to the right deal that works. And so what that means um, very, as a simple example is, you're buying widgets from a Chinese company. You think their costs are uh, $5. You're going to sell those widgets for $10. Um, if you negotiate a price from them of $5.01, you are going to have problems down the road. That Chinese company is not going to be happy with you. They're making the deal because they're desperate at the time. And they're going to look for ways to save money because they're going to have to. 
Uh, and so they're going to, uh, instead of making it with 25% stainless steel, they're going to make it with 10% stainless steel and your product's going to rust and all your customers are going to complain to you. And yes, you saved three cents uh, a widget, but you just ruined your own business. So if you want to work with the Chinese company long term, you have got to compromise. Um, and you have got to set up your arrangement so that it can work for the both of you long term. Now, where I really love this slide is when talking about joint ventures. And Rose mentioned joint ventures during the introduction. I wasn't planning to talk about joint ventures because I don't think joint ventures are terribly relevant to sourcing product from China. But when she mentioned joint ventures, it, I realized that we do have a lot of clients who think that forming a joint venture with their Chinese manufacturer is either necessary or a good idea. And I'm here to tell you that 99.5% of the time, that is a terrible idea. Uh, it's a great idea for your lawyers because we get to charge you a lot of money to form that joint venture. Uh, and if you don't pay us a lot of money to form that joint venture, you are virtually guaranteed to have major, major problems for the rest of your life in China. Uh, but the reality is, is joint ventures almost never make sense if all you want to do is buy widgets from China. Now, maybe if you want to set up a 10 year uh, deal where you and your Chinese manufacturer together create a new product, then maybe a joint venture will make sense. But regular sourcing contracts, regular sourcing deals are cheaper, easier, safer, and almost always better in every single way. Um, has anyone out there had the idea or been asked to form a joint venture uh, by a Chinese manufacturer? Okay. Um, sorry, there's none right now. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, Rose, what did you say? So I was just saying that there's, no one has responded to that. So um, oh, right. possibly not. Okay, all right. So what are the manufacturing contracts that make sense with your Chinese supplier? I'm gonna run through each of these rather quickly. Um, the first is an NNN agreement. That is an agreement where the Chinese supplier agrees that they're not going to compete with you they're not going to circumvent you, which means go around you to your own customers. And they're not going to disclose your secrets. The most important provision usually is the non-compete. Because what that does is if you're going, if you've developed this widget, um, you do not want to pay a Chinese manufacturer to make that widget for you and then also make it for themselves and sell your widget for themselves all around the world. And so you want to limit what they can do. Now there are limits in terms of the limits. So for example, I remember many years ago, a company said to us, we want these computer bags made by this Chinese company and we don't want them making computer bags for anybody else. And we looked at the company and we said, this company is a huge company. They're making computer bags for Walmart, which is a huge American company. Um, they're not going to agree not to make computer bags for anybody else. That's what they do. And anyway, why do you care if they're making computer bags for other companies? You just don't want them making your computer bag. What makes your computer bag so special? And our client said, well, we've got this really cool passport pocket and we use orange stitching. So we went back to the Chinese manufacturer and said, look, we don't want you making computer bags with orange stitching or a passport pocket right here like this. And they said, fine. And our client's been dealing with this 
same manufacturer for probably 15 years now. You can do that. And legitimate Chinese companies are fine with that because their goal is not to steal your product. Um, if they won't sign something like that, that tells you what their goals are and you should probably look for someone else. You can also limit them geographically. Let's say you sell your computer bags just in Mexico and you're sell thinking of selling them in Costa Rica also. Put in there that they can't sell computer bags to Mexico or Costa Rica. If they're already selling to Mexico and Costa Rica, they'll probably say no, but if you're big and powerful enough, they might say yes. So you can ask. So that's, that can be a very important agreement to protect. It also can be important to protect your intellectual property. Okay, product development agreements. A lot of times, a foreign company will go to a Chinese manufacturer and say, hey, we've got this idea for a widget. Can you figure out how to make it and then make it and sell it to us. And the Chinese company will say yes. And then the Chinese company will work with the foreign company. And then four months later, they have this terrific widget. And then the American company says, okay, I'd like to buy 50,000 of these widgets for $4. And the Chinese company says, no, it's going to be $8 and I own all the rights in the widget. This happens a lot. The American foreign company or whatever, they come to us and they say, we've got a problem. Um, what can we do? And we'll do some research and learn that the Chinese company has, now has a patent on the product. And the answer usually is, there's nothing we can do. They own the product. And why wouldn't they own it? They developed it, they patented it, you didn't pay them. So people think they're, that they're getting something free in those situations and what they're usually getting is a disaster. Um, the way to avoid that is by contract. And oftentimes that does require that you actually pay for the product development. So if we go back in time with that same company, what they should have done is they should have said, help us develop this product. We will pay you $50,000 for this work. And when the product is developed, it belongs to us. And then we're gonna buy it from you for $4. Now that's, that last part is difficult because a lot of times the Chinese company will say, well, I don't know whether I can sell it to you for $4 because we don't know exactly what the product's gonna be like. Um, so a lot of times they won't agree to that part, but even so it's your product. And once it's developed, if they charge you $8, you can say, well, this is my product. I'm going to go to the manufacturer down the road and have them make it for me for $4. And you can do that because it's your product. But if it's their product, you can't. Um, so product ownership agreements, those are sort of like product development agreements, but they're a lot simpler. They basically say little more than I own this product, you don't. Uh, then there's the manufacturing agreement. That's the key agreement. That will list all the things that matter to you as the buyer. It may list price, it may, it'll list um, delivery dates, it'll list quality requirements, and most importantly, it will list out what happens if the Chinese company doesn't breach it. And I'll be talking more about good Chinese contracts in a little bit. Okay, um, licensing agreements. I'm gonna go through this super quickly. Um, you're in the product supply business. You've got this terrific product. Some Chinese company comes to you and says, I see you've got this terrific product. I wanna license it from you. The licensing agreements tend to be the same all around the world. The only difference with China, two differences, make sure you get paid because oftentimes the Chinese company will say that they will pay you, you know, 10 cent, $1 for every widget they sell. And then you really have no way of monitoring it 
or they'll say that they'll pay you after the first year and then they never do. So we always like to see our clients get paid some large good amount up front. You're also supposed to register these agreements with the proper government agency in China. Um, and what Chinese companies often say is, hey, don't worry about it. We'll go register that for you. And then they don't. So you really need to check on that. Okay, um, why bother with a contract? We get this question a lot because Americans, Europeans, they are of the view there is no law in China. Um, what we always tell them is there are three reasons to have a contract with your Chinese supplier. Number one, clarity. You're dealing across cultures, you're dealing across languages. The classic example I always use because it happens all the time is our client will say to the Chinese company, can you get us our widgets in 20 days? And the Chinese company will say, yes, no problem. And then our client will have us draft a contract that says widgets will be delivered with 20, within 20 days. And if they're not delivered within 20 days, there's a 1% fee that needs to be paid to us for each day it's late. And we put that in there and invariably the Chinese company will say, I can't sign this. I can't get it to you. I can't promise it to you in 20 days every time. And our client will say, well, you told us 20 days. And the Chinese company will say, well, what I meant was, yes, I can get it to you in 20 days, but not all the time. And then our clients are really mad because they think that the Chinese company has lied to them. The Chinese company didn't lie to them. It's just a different culture. Uh, so just having a contract forces the parties to confront their cultural differences. And in the end, we'll put in there 35 days and then the fee starts. And that's better for our client because they're not promising their downstream customers that they'll get the product to them in 25 days. So, they're, so clarity is important. Then the second reason, I don't know why it's on the right and not the middle, is prevention. Uh, Americans will always say to us, well, if um, the Chinese company breaches the contract, will I be able to enforce it in China? And our response always is, you're thinking too much like an American. The goal is not to be able to sue them and win. The goal is to not have to sue them at all. The goal is to get them to abide by your contract. And that's the prevention element. And the example I always give there is, let's take the typical Chinese factory. They're making widgets for 30 companies. They get really busy. They cannot make widgets for 30 companies. They're too busy. So they take five of the company's widgets and they offload the manufacturing to the crappy company down the road that's not busy. And you are one of those five companies. So you get bad product. How do you prevent that? What we put in our contracts is you cannot subcontract the manufacturing without our written approval. Now, does that work? Surprisingly enough, it works beautifully. I call it the bike lock theory of Chinese law. Do bike locks work? Not very well, but if you have one that takes 25 minutes to pick and someone else has one that takes three minutes to pick, they're gonna be the ones who get their bike stolen. If you have a Chinese manufacturer that makes product for 30 companies and only four of those companies say no subcontracting without written approval and they need to offload five companies to a crappy manufacturer down the road, well, they're not gonna pick your company because they're not stupid. They're gonna pick the company that's not gonna cause a problem to them. They're gonna pick a company that does not have that provision in their contract. So prevention is very important. Another thing we always get is, what about corruption? Why bother with a contract when there's corruption? And um, the answer I always give to that is, I talk about Russia. First off, China is not 
as corrupt as people think. In, the, in most worldwide rankings of corruption, China is about in the middle. And I think that's about where it belongs. Russia, on the other hand, is always down at the bottom of the pile. And that's where Russia belongs. And uh, we once had a case in a court in Russia. Um, let's say it was a $2 million case. If that case had been in the United States, our client would have won it 99 times out of 100. The contract was clear. The Russian company had clearly breached. Um, our local Russian lawyers told us, the, the case was in Vladivostok, they said that nine out of 15 lawyers are corrupt. We ended up getting one of the corrupt lawyers. What does that mean? It means that the other side could try to buy off that lawyer, but they'd have to pay that lawyer a lot of money. And they'd have to pay that lawyer, I'm sorry, they'd have to pay that judge a lot of money. They'd have to pay that judge a lot of money because the judge is taking a huge risk by ruling against our client in a clear cut case. And then if they rule, if that judge rules against our client, we can then appeal it to the court of appeals that has three judges and is in another city. And it's gonna cost a huge amount of money to pay off three judges in a case like that because we could always take it to the Supreme Court. So even in a country as corrupt as Russia, the fact that we had a really good contract allowed us to settle with the Russian company for very close to what we would have settled with that company in, let's say, Australia. So uh, I mentioned this because Americans and um, let's say Northern Europeans tend to think of corruption as an on-off switch. If a country's corrupt, contract's worthless. If a country's not corrupt, contract's worth its weight in gold. It's not that way. There are gradations. Okay, so what, what does a good contract look like? It should be in writing. And by writing, I mean old school writing. I don't mean emails. I don't mean um, purchase orders and invoices. It should be in writing. It should be one language. And by one language, I don't mean that it shouldn't be in Chinese and in English or in Chinese and in Spanish. I mean, it should have one official language. The contract should say Chinese is the official language. Um, or it should say English is the official language. You pick the official language based on where the lawsuit's going to be. Don't say Chinese is the official language and then also say all disputes will be resolved in a court in Kenya. Uh, if it's gonna be resolved in Kenya, uh, make English or Swahili the official language. If it's going to be resolved in China, make Chinese the official language. But the reason you don't want two official languages is because imagine having a case in Kenya where both Chinese and English are the official languages. Now you're going to have to have a lawyer who's fluent in Chinese, a lawyer who's fluent in English, and you're going to have to argue what the Chinese contract says, you're going to have to argue what the English language version says, and you're going to have to argue what the Chinese plus the English actually really meant. So basically you're tripling your litigation fees. Not a good idea. So let's say you've picked China as the place for the dispute. And, and surprisingly enough, that's usually the best place to pick. And I'll explain why very shortly. What you need in that contract is excruciating detail. Basically, under Chinese law, and this is, I'm not making a value judgment here. It's neither good nor bad, it's just the way it is. If it's not in the contract, it does not exist. Um, so if you have a bunch of purchase orders saying you want, uh, or let's say you buy a product, uh, you, you get a sample product and you say, this is perfect. The color's perfect. I want to buy 50,000 of them. And your contract doesn't specify exactly what the color is supposed to be. And then what they send you is a little bit different from the sample, and then you want to sue the Chinese company in China, you probably don't have a good case.
But if your contract says that color shall be Pantene number uh, 63541 and it's not, then you probably have a great case. So you've got to be clear and detailed in your contract. It also should be sealed. And what I mean by that is it should have the Chinese company's seal or its chop on it. Um, I don't know whether that's done in your country. That's very, very rare um, in places like the United States and Australia um, and Europe. And um, so companies in those places are just not used to it, but it's a good thing to have. Okay. Couple key things to think about in your contract. Liquidated damages. This is very powerful in China. And what liquidated damages are, they're relatively simple. If, the, if we get uh, more than 3% of product that's bad, you need to pay us X amount of dollars. Uh, if you're more than a day late, you need to pay us X amount of dollars. Chinese courts are used to these provisions. They like these provisions. They work. They work for prevention also. Chinese companies know that they work. They're afraid of them. And therefore, they don't mess with those provisions. So if your contract says, if you're more than 10 days late, you have to give us $100,000, you've just increased the odds of your Chinese company not being more than 10 days late. You've increased it tremendously. Because if they are more than 10 days late, you can go to a Chinese court and you can freeze their assets up to $100,000 relatively easily. And the Chinese company knows that and they're afraid of it. And so these work. Now, do they work perfectly? No, because this is China. Uh, I mean, it's not the world's greatest legal system. So what we've seen happen when something like this goes awry is our client will call the Chinese manufacturer and say, hey, listen, you owe us $100,000. Do we need to go to court to get it? And the Chinese company will say, no. Uh, how about we give you a 5% discount going forward? And our client will say no. And oftentimes they'll end up agreeing. The Chinese company sends our client $50,000 and um, gives them a 5% discount until the remaining 50,000 is paid. But the point is it prevents a lot of problems and if problems arise, it gives you a lot of leverage. These are important provisions. Then there's the dispute resolution provision. Where are you going to have your dispute? Most of the time, we like the dispute in Chinese courts. Now you're thinking, why are you saying that? You just told me their legal system's not that great. Why don't you have it in the United States for your American clients? I'll tell you why. Because if we have it in the United States, we sue the Chinese company in the United States, we win, we've got this terrific US judgment, but it's worthless because the Chinese company has no assets in the United States and Chinese courts do not enforce US judgments. So what do you have? You have a worthless piece of paper. Now you say, well, I'll go to China and sue them. No, you can't because China does enforce contracts and your contract said you have to sue them in the United States. So you're violating the contract by suing them in China. Also, China, like every other country that I know of in the world, does not allow you to sue someone twice. And you've already sued the Chinese company and you won. So the Chinese court will throw it out and they'll be right to do so. Okay, so they don't enforce US judgments. So I gave this same speech in Spain and um, right before I was to give it, I realized, wait a second, I should talk about Spain. So I called a bunch of Spanish lawyers and Chinese courts are required to enforce Spanish judgments, but they usually don't. Uh, so even if you're a Spanish company, you're probably better off in most circumstances having the dispute resolved in China. Um, I actually tried to look it up for Kenya. Um, and it seems to me that there, is, there are no treaties between Kenya and China that where China has to enforce Kenyan judgments. Um, I have no idea what the laws are for Nigeria, Uganda, or, or the Netherlands. Um, some of the other countries I know some of you are from. But the point is you need to be very careful. Um, and lawyers 
domestic lawyers have been trained to think, wow, um, you know, I'm a, a Spanish lawyer, my client's a Spanish company, the last thing I want is to be in a Chinese court, I'm going to set it up so that the case be in Madrid. Uh, that makes sense if you're a Madrid company dealing with a Seville company, but it probably doesn't make sense if you're dealing with a Chinese company. Okay, you can arbitrate outside China. That's another option. Um, that can be risky. Sometimes that actually does make sense. Um, let's say you have a case in China. What are, the, what are the Chinese courts like? Injunctive relief. Can you get a Chinese court to, to stop the Chinese company from selling your product? against the what the contract says. Maybe it's a lot more difficult in China than most other countries. That's why the liquidated damages provision is so important. You want in your contract to say, hey, if you sell my um, products in another country, you have to pay me $100,000. That's what works. Discovery, that's where... Um, you can ask questions of your um, Chinese counterparty. It's not usually done in China, which means you need to be prepared for the lawsuit before you bring it. Um, CTAC arbitration clauses. CTAC is one of the two really big arbitration bodies in China. If you're going to be buying from a Chinese state-owned entity, if you're going to be dealing with a Chinese state-owned entity, they will usually require a CTAC arbitration provision. A lot of our clients freak out about that. They think that's the worst thing in the world. It is not. Um, CTAC arbitration, there's, uh, I forget the other big arbitral body, they are legitimate. They have good arbitrators. Uh, there is, you can have a fair arbitration. It can be a good way to go. Um, and in your contract, you can, you have a lot of power as to how that arbitration is going to go. You can specify that the arbitration be in English. You can specify that it be in Dutch. You can specify that it be in Swahili. Whether or not that makes sense or not is another issue, but you can specify that if your Chinese counterparty agrees to it. Um, it's amazing. Uh, American companies, they always come to us. Uh, they'll come to us for help with their China arbitration. And we say, okay, yeah, we can help. Um, you know, we usually need at least two lawyers on the case because one of our lawyers is um, an expert in arbitration and the other has some arbitration experience, but is fluent in Chinese. And they'll go, fluent in Chinese? Why do we need that? And we go because the arbitration's in China and you didn't specify the language. So Chinese is the default language. And they're just shocked by that because they just assume that the whole, the United States runs the whole world and everything's in English. Well, it's not. Um, and this is true of most countries in Asia. If you don't specify the language, it's going to be in the native language. That makes sense. Now, it's interesting because a lot of countries in Latin America say that if you don't specify the language of the arbitration, it will be in whatever the language is of the contract. That also makes sense. But the key is specify the language if you care about the language, then you don't have to worry about what the law is. But you can also specify who the arbitrators will be. Um, what we like to do is we like to get one or two or even all three arbitrators to be foreign arbitrators. Um, sometimes we even specify exactly who the arbitrator is going to be. Um, a lot of times we like for our American clients, we like to choose Canadian arbitrators because until Meng Wanzhou got arrested in Canada, Canada was viewed as uh, by most Chinese companies as a neutral country. Um, it still is to a certain extent. Um, but depending on where you are, um, or you can choose an arbitrator who's going to be viewed as neutral. 
You can choose an arbitrator who's not going to be viewed as neutral. You could choose two Ugandan arbitrators. If you can get away with it, great. Okay, um, protecting your intellectual property. How do you do that in China? I said there's, there's structural issues, there's contractual issues, there's registrations. I talked about the structural issues. That was the things like due diligence. I talked about the contracts. Now I'm gonna very briefly talk about registrations. Registrations to protect yourself. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, licensing agreements. These tend to be fairly similar all around the world with one major exception for some of you, and that's trademarks. Half of the world is, roughly half of the world is what is typically called a first to file jurisdiction. The other half is a first to use. The United States, Australia, Canada, the UK, I don't know about Kenya. I'm guessing Kenya is, follows the UK. Um, those countries are first to use. And what that means is, take our law firm name. It's Harris Bricken. We have, I think, never filed a trademark for that. We have a trademark on China Law Blog, but we don't have a trademark on Harris Bricken. Uh, we've, we haven't registered a trademark. Why not? Because if anyone were to form a law firm and call it Harris Bricken in the United States, we could sue them and we would win easily because we were the first to use it for a law firm. That's the US system, that's the UK system. That is not the China system. In China and in most of Europe, um, the first to file for the trademark gets it. So if someone in China were to file a trademark for Harris Bricken, <clears throat> they would get it, even though we've been using that name for a long, long time and they haven't. <clears throat> they would almost certainly get it. Um, now it can get a lot more complicated than this um, in that what if somebody files the name Harris Bricken for a consulting company in the United States? <clears throat> um, it's not a law firm. What are our rights? But generally with China, you have got to file your trademark or someone else will. And this is true even if you are not selling your products in China. This is where people make a mistake because they think, oh, I have to be using it in China to need to file it. No. Manufacturing in China is enough. So what happens is, let's say you're making your widgets and you do not register um, your brand name for those widgets. And someone else in China goes off and, excuse me, I'll, I'll be right back. There's a noise, I'm gonna need to shut down. It's the COVID era. My wife is on a loud Zoom call. I asked her to turn it down a bit. Okay, so if you're manufacturing your widgets in China and you don't register your brand name for those widgets, someone else might do it. And then what they can do is they can seize your widgets at China Customs before they leave China and they can hold those widgets because you violated their trademark rights. And this happens a lot. And it used to happen so often by the Chinese factory that China made it invalid for China, your factory to go off and register your trademark. Because what the factory would do is they would register your trademark and then three years later, you would say, you know what? you're just not making enough good product for me anymore. I'm leaving. And the factory would say, well, that's great, but you better not put your name on your products with that other manufacturer because I own it. China was so embarrassed by that, they said that would not work anymore. Well, the problem is 
Chinese factories aren't stupid. So your Chinese factory in Shenzhen is not going to go off and register your trademark anymore. They're going to have their cousin in Xi'an do it. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. So you have got to register the trademark on your brands. Because if you don't, once you start succeeding with those brands or those products, someone else will, and you're going to have big, big problems. We had four European companies come to us once because um, one company in China had registered all four of these company names. And these four companies made up about 90% of the market. And by the time we had um, <clears throat> told them how to get around this problem and they had been able to get around it, which was not easy or cheap and was also not a, a terrific solution. It was just the best solution in the circumstances. By the time that happened, this Chinese upstart company had about 40% of the market worldwide. Uh, because our clients could not have their products made in China anymore with their brand names on it. Okay, um, so China trademark. Someone will apply for your trademark and they will probably get it and be able to keep it. Even if you are only manufacturing in China for export, you need a trademark. If you're selling in China, then you should get both in English or whatever your native trade brand name is and a Chinese language one. Okay, a um, few tips on trademarks. Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan are not part of the People's Republic of China, mainland China. They're not part of that for trademark purposes. Filing to get filing a China trademark through Madrid, that's where you can file for all countries, can be risky. Once you file for your trademark, you have three years to use it. Um, and then they're valid for 10 years. They're really good things, China trademarks. I call it the only no-brainer of Chinese law. Um, they're not expensive to get. They're incredibly valuable. Patents, they're not as, they, they're tough to enforce in China. They're more expensive to get. Copyrights, if you're doing software, books, movies, there's a lot of value in registering your copyright in China, and it's incredibly inexpensive. China's trade secrets, China has trade secret laws, um, like trade secret laws all around the world. If you have to sue on them, it's expensive, it's squishy. If you don't want a Chinese company doing something with your trade secrets, make it a contractual requirement. Then it's not a trade secret law that you're dealing with, it's something that's very clear. If you tell anyone about this, you owe us $100,000. You can just list out what it is. You don't have to prove that it's a trade secret. Proving that something's a trade secret is difficult. Thank you, everybody. Um, happy to take any, of, any and all of your questions. Please fire away. Wow, thank you for that, Dan. It sounds like quite a maze operating in China. So I'm not sure how you do it, but thank you for the presentation. Um, we have a question from Austin Ketinia, who says, from your experience, what would you recommend as better, more efficient dispute resolution mechanism for Chinese contracts? Is it adjudication through court process or through arbitration? That, that is a super important question. And I'm going to give you the answer that lawyers love to give, and then I'll give you a better answer. The answer we love to give is, it depends. Um, I mean, I, there is no one answer. What I will tell you is that probably 95% of the time, our contracts say that the dispute will be well, actually, let me, 90% of the time, they say the dispute will be resolved in a Chinese court. 5% of the time in a Chinese arbitral body. And 4.95% of the time in arbitration somewhere outside China. Usually the riskiest thing is to say, 
I'll have the dispute resolved in a Uganda court because you, you, you bring the lawsuit, you win in Uganda, then you have to take that judgment to China. And China, unless that Chinese company has assets in Uganda, which is extremely unlikely. Um, and then you go to the Chinese court and they won't enforce it. And even if they will enforce it, you just have, you're gonna have to go through essentially two different litigations. And one of the mistakes that we see, I mentioned this with trademarks, it's also true of um, dispute resolution. People think Hong Kong and China are the same. Well, legally, and I'm, this is not politically, legally, they're different. Um, and that doesn't mean Hong Kong is not a good place to have your arbitration, but it does mean, and it is a good place to have arbitrations, but it does mean that it's not China. So you are complicating things. All right. Um, question from Himanshu. Um, he says, why are we not initiated any action to set sustainable sourcing channel? Um, between Africa and India. And um, you also talk about the issue of PPE quality and refund. Is it better to source that from, Af from India rather than you know, China? Okay. <clears throat> Great question. I don't know. Um, and I don't know because I don't know um, about sourcing PPE from India. But what I do know, first I'll talk about PPE, then I'll talk about products in general. When the coronavirus hit, we started getting a ton of calls regarding PPE. And we formed a PPE team and um, we've been dealing with PPE ever since. And one of the first things we did what with our PPE team did was try to find other countries from which we could buy PPE because China, we knew China was going to be, and it has been just a complete nightmare every single step of the way. You've got fake companies. You've got companies that are not fake that were making t-shirts until two months ago, and now they're making really bad PPE. You've got China Customs that is uh, holding back the good PPE for China and letting the crap go out. Um, you've got China Customs that changes the rules every 10 or 14 days. Uh, it, it's just, it, it is a nightmare. Um, so we looked at other countries and, um, what we found was that a lot of other countries that had PPE were getting their PPE from China. So that didn't really reduce the risks. Um, what we're finding now is that a lot of other countries have really stepped it up and are making more PPE. So they might be charging more than China but your total cost in the end is probably going to be less. So we represent a number of large hospital chains in the United States and some charities and even some countries trying to get PPE. And the hospital chains tend to be the savviest and a lot of them are now getting PPE made in the United States, made in Korea, made in Malaysia. Um, made in Vietnam. Those countries are all more reliable and just overall better. Um, I don't know about India for PPE, but what I will tell you is that um, we have seen an evolution in terms of buying product from China. Um, 15 years ago, um, we would tell our, our clients would say, you know, I want to buy um, this product from China because I can save five cents per item on this $20 item. And I, we would tell them, don't do it. Uh, the quality 
is risky. The delivery dates are risky. You're going to need, everything's international. You're going to have to pay your lawyers more. You're going to have to, you're shipping all these things. It's not worth it for that kind of savings. We would have that conversation all the time 15 years ago. Then starting, and I'm terrible with dates, maybe seven or eight years ago, we completely stopped having the conversation because China quality started improving so much, the risk started declining, the savings were higher. Um, we just would not have that conversation. It was just, we wanna buy from China and we'd go, okay, tell us the terms, we'll work with you. Well, starting with, and again, I'm sorry, I'm terrible on dates, but probably a year and a half ago with our American clients, we started having the conversation again because the US started enacting tariffs on Chinese goods. And we would say, wait a second, you know, you're gonna have your wooden toys made in China. You're gonna have to pay a 25% tariff on that. Have you thought about Thailand? And they would say, yes, but we can't figure out how to do it in Thailand. And we'd say, well, here's somebody we know who can help you. And then they'd have it made in Thailand and then they would Every time we would talk to them, they would thank us because not only are they not paying the 25% tariff, but the quality is higher and the prices are lower. And we're seeing a lot of that across the board. So what I always say, and people get mad at me when I say this and say, oh, that can't be true. It is true. All of our clients want to stop manufacturing in China pretty much all of them. And people will go, well, then why don't they stop? Well, because it's not that easy. For a lot of them, it's gonna take years. A lot of them just can't do it. The only companies that still want to manufacture in China are the ones that also sell their product in China. All the other ones are tired of all the problems, all the risks, they have had it. The, but that doesn't mean they can get out. Um, but eventually it is going to happen. And people say, oh, that's just American companies. No, that's not just American companies. It is all of our clients. Um, Vietnam is easier, Thailand is easier, Mexico is easier. Um, every country, Poland is easier, Ukraine is easier, India is easier. Now all these countries have their own problems, but they're easier than China. And so eventually it, it is going to happen. And uh, it, it is happening already. Um, so, but it, it is not going to be easy. We had a, a company that made clothing and um, well-known designer. They moved all their production to Vietnam maybe four or five years ago. And they kept telling us how much they preferred it. Everything's better blah, 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 blah. And then within two years, they had moved back to China. And we're like, we thought you loved Vietnam. What's going on? And they said, we did. We didn't want to move back to China, but we had to because Vietnam became, it was too expensive. And I'm like, well, how can that be? Vietnam's a lot cheaper than China. The problem was they were making in Vietnam but these are high-end clothing items. They would need zippers, they would need buttons, they would need this fabric, all from China. And by being in Vietnam, their shipping, their logistics, their transportation costs went way up. And they would have to fly over zippers at the last minute. And they moved back to China for cost reasons. China is amazing. Um, I mean, they have an amazing infrastructure for manufacturing. What they also have, uh, one of my best friends is a lawyer in Mexico and we've been friends forever. And one day he said, we were both complaining about the fact that not enough manufacturing is moving from China to Mexico. And he said, it's because we're the worst country in the world at bringing in this sort of manufacturing. And I said to him, no, you're not the worst country in the world. You're tied with every other country in the world. China's the best and everybody else is terrible. Nobody else is good at making it easy to manufacture. If I wanted to manufacture a widget 
and I don't know how to manufacture widgets, I could find 10 good companies online for China and I couldn't find any of them for Thailand or for Mexico. Okay, Dan, so um, we are almost coming to the end. So I'm going to combine some two or three questions into one question. So we have a question from Jimmy Mwangangi asking, I wonder in your experience, do Chinese state-owned enterprises own a CTAC and other arbitrations? Then we have another question from Chris Owanda uh, asking, what is the Chinese national policy on quality for export of products? It looks totally responsible that they have an aggressive drive for exports and they will still compromise on qualities. Um, I, I had, so, uh, there's a lady that had so many questions that are coming in. I would want to find at least one of our questions. Okay, let me quickly answer those. And if anybody has a question, feel free to email me and I will answer it. Okay, so state-owned companies, CTEC arbitration. Not as bad as you would think, because if you're going to be contracting with a company in Xi'an, get the CTEC arbitration in Shanghai. Get one or two foreign arbitrators. Get If you have one foreign arbitrator, make sure that foreign arbitrator is, a, uh, is the chairperson of the arbitration. Um, there are ways you can protect yourself. We have had good luck with CTAC arbitration. It, it, you just have to be careful and do it right. Does China's policy on quality? It has no policy on quality. None. They claim to have one on quality of PPE. I think that policy is to ship out the bad product. <laughs> okay, so, so interesting. So I guess there's Probably one last question that is always in the, the developing countries' uh, minds, um, and especially in Africa, is that uh, Europe and uh, the West are most likely, and America, are most likely to repatriate capacity or look for alternative uh, sourcing and manufacturing areas, especially in the wake of uh, COVID-19. And this leaves Africa exposed uh, because we hugely depend on um, China. And if China is economically pressured, where does it leave us with the debt trap on the projects that we have, those huge ones? What is your opinion on this and what could be the possible recourse for African countries and African companies that uh, have very many uh, ongoing projects in China and incoming projects? Okay, great question. I'm gonna give uh, some very controversial answers. Okay, I take great delight every time one of our clients moves their manufacturing to Mexico, moves their manufacturing to Nicaragua, moves their manufacturing to Ethiopia, anywhere in Africa, because China dominates and China is um, not terribly kind to the rest of the world. I would love to see countries in Africa bring as much manufacturing home as they can. Um, I, I mean, it, it's good for countries. I know I've read a lot about the clothing industry in Africa. A lot of things could be manufactured there. Um, it's, I mean, it's easier said than done, but um, it has to happen and countries have to work together to make that happen. And um, I'm going to now criticize my own government. We uh, complain about China. We make it tougher to buy from China, but we do nothing to make it easier um, for countries like Uganda to buy and then to make and then sell to the United States. And uh, Americans are not very international. Uh, they don't realize that there are a lot of countries out there that can be doing a lot of things in terms of, of manufacturing. Um, I, I guess that's just my view. Um, in terms of Africa specifically, don't let yourself fall into the trap of thinking that you have to buy from China. Don't 
buy from China to save one cent, buy from India, uh, pay a penny more, establish a relationship there, buy from Ethiopia, buy from Nigeria. Um, just like I said in the old days here, it wasn't worth buying from China to save a little bit of money. I think that that's very true now for every country in the world. Now, you know, I, I'm not talking about Apple um, you, or, or companies that, you know, are incredibly sophisticated and buy huge quantities. I'm talking about smaller companies, mid-sized companies. Um, if you're thinking long-term, think about all the risks that, there, that come with China. Now, of course, there are risks with India also. Um, but one of the things that has surprised me is we've had a lot of companies that have shifted their clothing manufacturing from China to Pakistan. And, uh, you know, Pakistan's not exactly known for having a great legal system. I would guess in most rankings, it does very poorly. Um, but our clients have had a lot of success in Pakistan. Um, and one of the things I always like to point out is that about a year ago, China was the largest manufacturer of blue jeans now that are exported to the United States. Now Mexico is, and um, Vietnam is going to, is I believe second, no, Mexico's number one, I think Bangladesh is number two, and Vietnam is soon going to be number three. Why is that happening? Because it's easy to move your jeans manufacturing elsewhere, and these companies have decided they're better off doing so. That doesn't mean you can do that with your uh, tablet manufacturing, but it does mean that it is coming. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you everyone uh, who, who attended. It was a small United Nations today. I can see quite very heavy comments from participants from India, uh, the Netherlands, and other countries. So if anybody that we have not answered their questions, we have some on the chats that we will send to Dan. Uh, but also on this uh, presentation, on this slide, you can see Dan's uh, email address. Feel free to send in the questions get in touch to get help with your contracts, get help with their IP and all those from um, sourcing from China, uh, especially post COVID-19. I think things are going to take an interesting turn. Uh, be on the lookout for our next webinars. Uh, we have another one next Thursday, every Thursday, uh, depending on the country of the speaker, either early in the morning or in the evening. We thank you very much for your continued support. And we look forward to building Africa together post COVID-19. And thank you, Dan. If you have any last words for everyone, Dan, then we can close. I have some very brief last words. Number one, thank you everyone for attending. And number two, if any of you have manufacturing facilities in Africa or anywhere else, feel free to tell me about them and I will pass them on to my client, to our clients, because that would be terrific service for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rose. Everybody have a good night and God bless and stay safe. Thank, thank you, Ben and uh, Dan. Have a good evening. So long. <laughs>